Thank you. Can we be seated please? Can I just say thank you for the joy it was to be here, brother? Unexpected to be suddenly in this town, in this area. And what a privilege that God just worked it all out when I didn't know that I was coming here and very few only God knew. And somehow it all worked out in the most marvelous way. Normally we know months before exactly the tour, and all the arrangements, all the advertising, but here on this occasion through cancellation that had to happen through various strong reasons, I just knew God had something in mind and this is what it was. So bless God. And it's a joy to have come here. So to Pastor Stowers, thank you very, very much for your kindness in letting me come. And may God really bless every one of you. Also, to the dear people who have brought me here each night. They are about four or five hours away. Um, Ed and Mary Shaw and their son Jonathan. What a blessing they've been. A lovely, godly family. And what a godly young man. He sat there at the piano last night and the way he played with no shame and in such a godly, sanctified way that I was edified and lifted up with such a blessing of this young man's life. So I thank them for their bringing me back and forth. The people whom I stayed with, Terry and Roxanne Fawcett, they couldn't come this morning or tonight. They were here last night and the night before. But uh, through their own churches, long time of arranging, especially for today, special outreach and things they're doing. So I just want to say thank you to them, even though they're not here, because there are people that will just tell them I thank them very much and their children. Out of this big fortress they're building, if you haven't seen it yet, you're in for a surprise. Coming from the Wild West. <laughs> but anyway, they're doing it with all spiritual things in mind for conferences that I believe groups will use as the years. I've had the joy of staying there with them. And what a blessing it is to have been with them. Now I was praying much about what to preach. And I had a whole lot of things to do. Because I'm moving on. And I had to pack. And suddenly I realized I didn't have the time that I would like to. But this happens. And you have to be ready for anything in God's service. So as I was coming along in the road, I was really praying. And uh, that which I really felt in my heart would be very appropriate in the rush of the afternoon, which doesn't normally happen. And suddenly these verses came in my mind that I'm going to preach on tonight. And I do believe, although it's the exact opposite message you might be expecting or wanting, I do believe this is what God wants for us to listen to tonight. Forgive me unloading all my pockets. But uh, that's when you're going to travel. I just put everything together and here I am in the pulpit now unloading, trying to get the weight off. Now, let's have a prayer. A short prayer before I bring that which I believe the dear Lord has put on my heart. Father, have mercy on me. I am a man of base, weak, unworthy. But thou didst carefully choose the base things of the world, the weak things of the world, the things that are despised. Let no flesh should glory in thy presence. And this is the last man in this world that could, Lord. Thank thee for thy Amazing grace. This is written across my whole life. How I bless thee. That thou who didst begin in my heart hast kept me all these years to preach again tonight. And I ask, Lord, with everyone here that loves thee and knows thee, speak. Don't let this opportunity be wasted through my baseness weakness, unworthiness. Wash me in the blood of Jesus the Christ afresh. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Protect us from our enemy, the devil, that has destroyed billions of lives. 
and could be about to destroy our lives totally. Come God in mercy and speak to the saved, speak to the lost, but speak to every heart as only God can be speaking to such a variety of different people at different places in their lives in their pursuit of God. Please come and somehow visit our hearts to make us walk out of this place unable to ever be the same, whether we're saved or unsaved. In Jesus Christ's name, in Jesus the Christ's name, Amen. I have memorized so much of this lovely book, I didn't even know I was doing it. When I first saved, just on 40 years ago, 28th of June, 1968, something remarkable happened. I didn't ask for it. I didn't know this is what a person should desire. But from the night I was saved, I just devoured this book. It was like somebody who had been suffocating all his life and suddenly found the source of oxygen, the source of survival. And I just devoured this book. By the time the dear Lord had separated my life to preach, which he did in an astonishing way, that I trembled the way God was saying to me clearly that everything in the whole world was crying out, You preach. Bury every dream you've ever made, every plan. Oh, God came... But then the dear Lord revealed something precious to memorize the Holy Word, to preach the Word. He honors His Word above all things. So God help me. And as I began to memorize, I realized most of what I've learned I knew already. Before I ever thought of it, it just burned in my heart. Because I stuck to the old King James language with the these and thou's that everybody says you can't understand. But somehow multitude and multitudes across this world did understand what I quoted and quoted and quoted and quoted sometimes to 20,000 people sometimes to 100 but God honors his word above all things children many who never heard the King James in their life just began to see God now one of the books that I took my whole time and began to discipline myself when God had showed me what he wants of me was the book of James. That was one of the first books I memorized of the New Testament and I was astonished what God did through that single book as I have preached it probably over a thousand times. Way more, sorry. Because I preach every day, sometimes four times a day over the years. I don't want to quote the whole book of James to you tonight. I'd like to, but I believe God put a passage in the light of the rest of the scriptures concerning what James says. I'd like to consider some things here tonight that perhaps you've never considered in your life, whether you're young or old. James asks this Staggering question. In the last chapter, chapter 5, verse 14, he asks a lot of questions in this book, but this question is staggering. He says, Is any among you, is any among you sick? Is any among you sick? If I took it literally and quoted it, longing for God to visit us as if it's just being said for the first time but from the heart of God. And I ask you tonight, is any among you yet tonight sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. 
and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. Now that's not speaking about confessing your sins like some movements say this verse is saying. No, in the context, if you're sick, confess the physical ailments, the problems you have. And pray one for another that ye may be healed. That ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Accomplishes staggering things literally. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then he gives an illustration from the Old Testament. Elias, speaking of Elijah. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years. Three years and six months. And he prayed again. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain. And the earth brought forth her fruit. Staggering, staggering passage. Jesus said, ask, and it shall be given you. <coughs> Sorry. James says, ye have not, because ye ask not. Hitherto have ye asked nothing of the Father in my name. But from henceforth, whatever he shall ask of the Father in my name, that is his will, it shall be done. Isn't that staggering? That God puts himself into a holy obligation by such promises to you and me, and then he staggers us by saying, you have not, because he asked not. effectual, fervent prayer. Have you ever prayed like that, young man? Once in your life, to God. That God and heaven have to listen. You're so earnest. And so full of faith that you wouldn't pray so earnestly if you didn't have faith. Faith makes you earnest. Because you know God listens to a man who's earnest. Effectual, earnest prayer of a righteous man. Righteous? Yes, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. 1 John 3 verse 20 says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments. Because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in sight. Whatsoever we ask, we receive of him. Because we keep his commandments. What is the condition? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, rightly related, a man right with God. There's always a condition attached to any promise in the Bible. There's always a condition in this context, and it always costs. But it costs you a billion times more if you don't fulfill the condition to receive the promise, even concerning prayer. Here this man speaks of Elijah. Strange he should choose Elijah, who is a man subject to like with weaknesses we have. He wasn't just a superhuman. He had his fears, his doubts, his staggerings, his ups. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. Well, he prayed so that the land would turn back to God. He just didn't want to prove a miracle. That's rubbish. That's sensationalism. To prove anything to anybody by something God is going to now do through you 
is total carnality. To advertise for that is total carnality. And you have the wrath of God resting over you if you advertise to draw people through miracles, etc. Be careful. You have one thing to propagate, brother, sister. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be careful by what you propagate God's word to get your people. But this man prayed for something that was rather obnoxious on the eyes of a normal human being. That it would stop raining. Can you imagine the devastation of the three years and six months? The cattle, the animals, dead, just lying, the corpses. Can you imagine? No water, no rivers. The heat, the lands, the crops, the devastation. No wonder when the king, the evil Ahab, saw Elijah, he says, Oh, my enemy. He was so wicked, but he knew this is the man that brought this devastation. He prayed for this. He was praying for revival. He was praying for a nation to turn back to God. And it worked. He brought the nation on its knees. You'll be stunned what this old man has prayed for. I think they'd jail me in my country when they realize who was praying for that. I want to write... Oh, I'm writing many... How does a preacher finish a book? I'm preaching all the time. I can't bury the preaching for the books, but I'm busy because they say they want to publish these books all over, you know. So I'm busy. One book that I'm writing, oh, just enjoying when I get little moments here and there, I want them please to publish only when I'm dead because otherwise they'll kill me prematurely. And I don't want that. Most of what God did, I, I'm scared to even put down because people will say, no, this man is a liar. No one, no one could move the hand of God for that in his weakness. No human. So I'm scared. And many things I'm not going to say. Even when I die, I have to keep it back so nobody starts doubting the integrity of this man. But a lot I'm going to say. And I hope probably most of the stuff will be printed after I'm dead, if Christ tarries and if it's his will to print all these things. I'm a preacher, not a writer. But they're pushing me for these things. I remember walking along a dust road that was to all the lands in Africa to a very big convention center that had been built by a very godly man that housed crowds and crowds that came from all over our country. But there was this heavy heat and everything was dry, the dust, oh, car would come along and I'd say, oh no, and I'd walk right away because there's dust. <laughs> You'd nearly suffocate and die because there's no rain for so long in that area. That happens in Africa. Terrible devastation when there's drought. And I am crisscrossing all my life to different parts of Southern Africa to different conventions, etc. Well, I was so basking in the heat and I said, Lord, I have to walk. I can't stay on my knees. My mind doesn't function. I have to walk into oxygen to get a clear of mind so I can be sharp in the pulpit in this convention. And here I'm going over messages with this heat. And I remember just groaning. God, please. I groan. Send rain. Send heavy clouds, thunder, lightning. I said, heavy rains. And send it fossil. Now, I ask in Jesus Christ's name, but I meant it. And I wasn't playing the fool. I was really basking. I couldn't think. I could hardly walk. I felt myself like a piece of meat burning. Couldn't walk. It was just devastating. When I said in Jesus Christ's name, I got a fright. I got frightened. I suddenly saw this wind. Now, it was lands and valleys that I was walking through. The wind came so fast, so swiftly, there wasn't a cloud that I remember in the sky. Within about four minutes, I just saw the dust as this wind came. This incredible wind. In the end, I was holding up myself, trying to stand up. And the whole sky was dark within about four minutes. With clouds. Well, I so panicked, I began to ask God for mercy for praying such a prayer. Because I wasn't so stupid as to think that it wasn't my prayers. When you groan like that, God has a holy obligation. And it's not carnality. No. Throughout the whole convention, right through the days and days, there was this cool, wonderful 
Rage. Slight drizzle. We did pray afterwards for rain for the farmers, and the rains came when the commanders. But they were astonished. The people, look at this. Suddenly, when it's all this long period. Now, I am going to perhaps write the numbers of times I've prayed. The reasons you pray things could anger the wicked to bring a nation back to God. Not just to stop being hot. And so I'm going to stop there and not share, but I only share this after 38 years of preaching, 39 years of preaching. I only share this now. Much of these things I've never dared to share, but God said to me, I can trust you now to say these things. You won't touch the glory because you know I'll throw you in the dust and you'll be crawling for You know now. So, I'm sharing. Because God can allow me to at this point of my ministry without having to be buried. And I have seen so many of the greatest preachers in the world buried when I heard them touching the glory just once. I won't let God do that to me. So don't you think the motive is wrong for my sharing such a thing as that. Again and again the dear Lord did these things across Africa especially. And I bless him for that. And now we come to what this man was putting to our awareness. Is any sick among you? He didn't say, be careful now. This could go out of hand. This statement. He was so sure of what he was writing by the Holy Ghost moving him. Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up. Hallelujah. That's a promise from the heart of God who now, through the Holy Word of God, if we act on it, if we embrace it, if we look in earnestness to it and obey it, how does God turn away his face and say, No, I'm not going to answer your prayer if you trust what I promised. Do you think God's capable of doing that? God wants us to be careful. I was a young preacher. I preached in a town called King Williamstown. In our country, quite a historic town. In one of the Lutheran churches, mostly German communities. And the Sunday morning after I preached the last sermon of that week of preaching, from Sunday to Sunday, I was going to leave. Everyone was all greeting me and different people, all the crowds all around. It was a massive church. And as I was in the car, just about to close the door and people speaking, farewell, someone ran to me and said, Listen, Brother Keith, they want you to come back in the church for a few minutes. There's someone they want you to pray for. So I said, All right, and I went back and there at the back of the pulpit is this little thing that you walk back down the pulpit and there the pastor prays and gets ready with the elders before they walk in. Well, there in there there was the elder, the chief elder. His name was Ernie Bolter. German name. Godly man. Ernie Bolter had been crippled with arthritis. So bad that for up to four years, it was on four years, he couldn't dress. He couldn't get out of bed. He had to be pushed and helped and lifted. A big man. He was in such pain. He couldn't get into the church door. Because there's all these steps. And they had to stand there. All these men helping him step by step. Because he was the head elder. He loved God, but he was sick. I was a young Christian about a thousand miles away. In a meeting with another German man came forward, I was sitting down there, and came forward when this old man called for those who were sick to come. He's going to anoint them in oil, with oil pray for them, as God has commanded us. Now he was a very famous and godly man, this old man. And obviously God had used him mightily, but I was young in the faith. And I remember him asking, with the loudspeaker, everyone sitting there still, he didn't say, go while we pray for them. You pray with me, he says. He asks this one man, this German man says, I'm not sick. But there's a man in King Williamstown who's a godly man. His name is Ernie Bolger. 
this man is crippled from arthritis. It's so bad that he can't clothe himself. He can't bath. He can't get out of the bed. He can't work. He's just in a terrible, terrible state of suffering. And it's now close on four years. And the church right now is sitting. Sunday morning. They're gathered. And they know that I'm coming out. And I'm going to ask you in this meeting when you would be set aside for praying for people to be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. I want you to anoint me in his place and pray for him while they're there, they're praying also. So all of us listened and this godly old man said, Oh, I understand. The Lord will heal him. I said, What presumption? I really thought that. How presumptuous. He anointed this man and prayed for this Ernie Bolger hundreds and hundreds of miles away. So far away. The exact moment he prayed, the exact moment that man stood up in his church and shouted, now you don't do that in Lutheran churches. You get excommunicated. You first get carried out if you carry on shouting. Trust me, you've got to be careful in the German Lutheran churches. This man stood up and shouted. And he jumped. Oh, doing that in the Lutheran church. Nobody was angered. Everybody just began to weep. I'm healed. God is here. He left. He never has had old writers from that day to this. He's very elderly now. And I have been in his home so many times. This man's joy as he glorifies God for touching him in one moment. Now, I know that was God. That wasn't some lie because there were hundreds of people witnessing it who aren't sensationalists, who aren't hyper-emotional and have to have sensation to tickle the ears, otherwise they won't go anywhere near a place. These people were so down to earth they, have, they were walking about a foot under the ground. And here they all were witness. You know this man. Now, here I was, coming back as a young preacher into this same building, the Lutheran church, where he had been healed. He was still the head elder. And his little granddaughter was there with his son and daughter-in-law. And his granddaughter was full of boils. I'll never forget his child. And she just sat there weeping. Weeping. She sat on the table. And it was almost like, I, I don't want to shock you, and I don't want to be grievous to God by sensationalizing. Like, like pus was in, running down. It was like, it was horrible to look at. On her legs, her arms. Now the mother, her eyes were so swollen from no sleep that it was staggering. She says, we just stay awake in the night to see weeps. We can't sleep. And the doctors have come to the end. They've given her such drastic medications it's having side effects. They can't. There's no medication works. They've just given up the specialists. Say, there's nothing. There's nothing we can do with the sickness. But we ask you to pray, Brother Keith. I was young. I was a young preacher. And I wasn't used to this. And I looked at this child. But my heart seemed to lift up. I can't explain that. And I said, all right. Come, we all in this room, just put our little hands on this child while I pray. Father, I had no oil to anoint her. We can demand nothing of thee. We can demand nothing of thee. But we have been called to ask in thy name, in faith. And if it be thy will, if it be thy will, Heal this child now. Not our will, but thine be done at this moment through this prayer. In Jesus Christ's name. Now I left, got in the car, drove. A few days went by. The father phoned me and the mother spoke. And later on, Uncle Ernie Bolger. Keith, that day as you drove away, we just saw as the hours went by, it all just stopped. By the night, it was just clearing. Within a day or two, it's just cleared up. The specialist cannot comprehend 
It's beyond him. He's staggered. That without any medication, and we told him why, he's healed. Totally healed. Now that did something for my faith. As a young preacher, that did something for my faith. I went to another town. A short while after that, weeks later, that uh, Port Alfred, along the north coast of the eastern Cape of Southern Africa. Lovely town. And God did a remarkable work. Many, many souls came to Christ, especially young people, streaming to God, that walked with God from that time to this. Lovely time. A lady, the next town, which is about 25 minutes, 30 minutes, those days about half an hour away, these days just a few minutes, the freeways have made it, but that was many years ago. A lady put a gun to her head. And there she was in her store. Behind the counter, the door was open. and She was sitting and she took this gun and she just began to scream, weeping, sobbing, before she would pull the trigger. And a Christian who's been in the meetings was just walked in the door. She saw her beginning to sob and cry. And she ran, asking God's protection under the blood. And she took the gun and startled this woman who was caught, about to kill herself. And this woman of the store began to pour her heart out as she asked, what's going on? They've lost everything. Everything is just being destroyed, the family, everything is destroyed in her life. She can't face another moment. She has to take her life. This woman said, you're coming with me to hear this young preacher down at Port Alfred. You're coming with me. Don't you argue. Go and get dressed. You're coming with me. I don't think she even left her. She made sure she come. Along with some of her family, they arrived. I didn't know she was there, and I preached. This lady was one that responded. I didn't pray with her. Someone else did. Some lady, as many responding. She was in one moment, in one prayer, mightily saved. To the degree that is beyond human comprehension. She suddenly found a peace that God says passes all understanding. Unless you have experienced it, no preacher, no human could ever give you words that you could come within a billion miles of what he's just talking about. God's peace, my peace, give I unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. God's peace that passes all understanding. Joy unspeakable. Do you know what that means? There's no words that could ever express the joy you know once you know God's peace. As the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that your sins are forgiven and you are now born of God. You are God's child and conscious from that moment you are His property. His responsibility. Suddenly, all that fear, all that torment was gone and joy was on this lady's face. She was so stunned at the peace of God that flooded her heart. She drags everyone now of her home. And the next night, she began to share in a humble way, but earnest, still looking broken because she had been through deep, deep waters, graying, wrinkles, dark rings, but there was this peace in her eyes. And she comes to me and she said, Sir, if God could do this for me in one moment, then I want you to pray for my daughter. My daughter was involved in an accident a long time ago and her back and parts of her body cannot be healed. This won't straighten. The specialists are giving up hope. She weeps. She's in these braces, all steel braces holding her body up. And we are despairing. If God can do this for me, I believe God can heal my daughter. I want you to pray for her. Now you know, to look at this girl was something. 
I can't say I had faith that would move mountains. I honestly, honestly can't say that. But I said, all right. I called for the preachers of the community that were born again. I called for some godly older people. The elders, the true elders, those that have proved their lives are real for a long time. That's a true elder. And I said, let's all just pray. Those that can't put your hands, there must have been about six, seven of us. You just pray, amen. Father, we can demand nothing of thee. But thou hast called us to ask, if this be thy will, God, not my will, not our will, but thine be done, please heal this child now, if it's thy will for us to pray for me. In Jesus Christ's name. Now that girl, her face just lit up. I can't tell you how it lit up. With some form of joy. She wasn't saved then. She did get saved. But that night she wasn't. She got home. She says to her mother, Mommy, I'm healed. And she's crying with joy. Please help me to take these things off. The mother said, No! We well, don't take that off. We go to the specialist tomorrow before you take it off. Let's be sure. Well, they went to the specialist quite a long traveling through the day to even get back to the meeting that night. The specialist said, but I can't understand. This girl is totally healed. There's nothing wrong with her. And he was worried. She said he almost looked angry. Because he couldn't comprehend it, physically. Now we have the specialist's name and address, by the way, in case you doubt it. He must be pretty old, come to think of it. But that was long ago. Uh, anyway, I've kept the name and address for many years. Well, they come there, and they want to share now. Have you ever heard people who have just found God's salvation? People who have just seen God's amazing mercy and compassion revealed in a staggering way. If you listen to the speaking, you just get a blaze for God. They wanted to test. Well, somebody said testify. You should have seen that. Well, she comes to me now and said, listen, Mr. Daniel, my little girl fell pregnant. I don't want to tell you the age. There she stood, this little girl. We've had sorrows you don't want to know about, sir. Such shame, such disgrace, such ostracizing from everybody else. Sir, she has to go to school for years. And I have to be the mother. With all our responsibility. And this baby, this baby, my grandchild, weeps and sobs through the night. We give medication, all these things they're going through. But nothing helps. I've been to the doctor. This child keeps us awake through the night. And it goes week after week, month after month. I perhaps could have faced things more, with more strength and sanity than I have if it wasn't for this child. If God could do this for me, if God could do this to my daughter, I want you to pray for this child. That God stop this child weeping. We can get back our strength. So we prayed. Well, it was many weeks later that a phone call came and said, Since that night, sir, that child has slept through the whole night. The only time it woke up was just to change his napkins, etc. But not once did the child keep us from the night. This is God. Hallelujah. And what it did to a young preacher's heart, you cannot believe. Oh, I went through the years, and I wish I could say everyone I prayed for in faith, hope and trust in this God of mercy that filled me with faith. I wish I could say everyone was healed, but they weren't. And it wasn't sin. 
in their life. It wasn't unbelief in my heart. There's a whole sermon. Some of you might have heard it on the websites and all these sermons going on all over the world. And people, they've got all these old sermons by, where I just preach the scriptures concerning sickness. No illustrations. And our God will is off in sickness. Often in the Bible. To the godliest of the godliest. Don't you stand there saying it's sin. I can't think of anything more carnal than a preacher or a Christian telling others who they can't even stand in the shadow spiritually of the person they are saying it's sin in your life. Unbelief. If they pray for you and you don't get healed, why isn't it their sin? They're the ones that prayed. Oh God. No, sir, be careful. And I don't want to spend now 20 minutes just quoting from the Old Testament right into the New. Many, many, many quotations of those who God did not heal were who were holy, who died honored by God. From Epaphroditus, Trophimus, Timothy. There's just one up there. You cannot believe how God doesn't expect us to take one isolated sin, one isolated verse and say, that's it. You look at that isolated verse and the rest of the scriptures, sir. And if any other scripture concerning that doctrine contradicts your interpretation, you're preaching heresy. That's why you've got to know the Bible from cover to cover. That's why you've got to study. Not just take isolated verses like the Jehovah Witnesses do. And half a verse, they're scared you might pick up the Bible and find you read the next half of the verse that cancels out what they're saying. <laughs> Look in the light of all scriptures to be balanced. There's nothing as dangerous as someone on fire who's not balanced. You can be on fire, sir, but you've got to be balanced. And the only way to be balanced is to know this book. And the only way to know this book is to meditate it day and night as your greatest delight and watch how God honors you. If you do, even if you're a young person. But be careful now. Don't you believe that everyone, and I must admit, some godly people I, I still cannot come near attaining their walk with God. I admit that. And I pray to them, and they die in their sickness. And I accepted that as God's will. Because it's all over the Bible. And now, there's some other things I need to go on very swiftly of what God does when we pray and ask. I wish I could go through all these things. Oh my. But I don't want anyone to look at the watch tonight. Because if you do, I'll have to say, why are you looking at your watch? And then I have to say, stand up on the chair, you that looking at the watch. And then you will get angry with me. Now, so I don't want to preach too long in case I have to do that to you and embarrass you. Try it. <laughs> we won't do that. That's why I don't wear glasses. I don't know if you're looking at your watch, you see. It's lovely to not know if you're pulling a face at me. I don't know. So, bless you. <laughs> now, Missionaries live by faith. Most in Africa honestly live by faith. Trust me, it's God or you die. Or get off the mission field. It's a very different concept, but it's a wonderful way to live. And when God separated me, I said to him, I'm telling no one in this earth my needs. No one in this world, not even daddy and mommy, would know that I have no money. And I've got to get through theological seminar. I've got to my personal needs, all the funds that are... I'm leaving this between thee and thee, Lord. I'm not going. Unless it's I'm your responsibility from day one till the day I die. And God honored that. You cannot believe the miracles. I wish I could start from the first time. How God, beyond all comprehension, just said to me, take no thought. For tomorrow, consider the lilies of the field. How they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed, clothed like one of these. Wherefore God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? They will take no thought. Think what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? And after all these things the Gentiles seek. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. Well, that's a command. 
Don't be anxious. Don't be silly now. Don't give in any anxiety. You're God's responsibility. Get right with God and get the will of God, even if you're a missionary in the middle of with no one. That God who reaches up and owns a kettle and a father. Well, God gave me those words when I prayed concerning him, nothing and no one in the world was to know. And I believed him. And 40 years later, 39 years later, he never failed me. Hallelujah. Oh, now I've missed enormous amount of these lovely illustrations, but that doesn't matter. I have boys, three sons. I wanted ten children, by the way. Forgive me, don't get angry with me. I just wanted a lot of kids, but God gave us three. And then my wife couldn't have children after that, so I accepted the three. What lovely child. Oh, she was enough, to be honest with you. And they kept us running. Any more would have killed us. But we love them, and that's what God gave us, our first mission field as our children. And oh, do they love Christ with every breath in their body. So is. Hallelujah for my godly three boys. One's preaching across America right now, while I'm preaching. Lovely fellow. Oh, I do bless God for them. Well, they grew up in the home where we had to really pray. I came home one day from ten days away from home happens. And my wife greets me at the door and within minutes, this is what missionaries' wives do. They like to shock you. Well, they don't have much say, but they do it. They, she says, Keith, did you get any money? That's what missionaries' wives ask. Don't think I'm asking you for money, okay? Too late for that. <laughs> so, I said, well, yes, how much? I don't know exactly how much, but roughly. Oh, that's not enough. We're in trouble, Skip. The telephone account people and the electricity both will cut us off tomorrow, first thing. 11 o'clock, I think. If we don't pay by some time, 9 o'clock or something in the morning, I don't know. Now a little tear came down her eye. She says, you know how, how shameful this is to me, Keith, that they did that. You've been away. I can't phone you and just alarm you when you're preaching, so I just kept quiet. I've been praying. But kids, we're in trouble. We need so much, and she mentioned an amount, I don't want to tell you, you won't believe how much we actually need it, or we're in trouble. She said, it's our testament. These people know we're missionaries. They said, this is people who serve God. Look at them. They can't even pay their accounts. What are we going to do? Well, the children were there. There was one or two other young fellows who were young preachers. I don't know. So I, I said, Virginia, God can't fail. He cannot fail. I said, let's pray. And then I'm going for a walk because I've traveled, my back's aching all the hours in this car. I have to go for a walk before the sun's gone in the cool of the evening. So, I said, listen, Father, we're thy responsibility. And therefore we ask, come, meet our need. Jenny has mentioned what we need. God, we cannot let them cut the electricity off, close the phone. And then all the thing of going through with the black list against our name, black mark. Please help us with this amount. And we need it before tomorrow morning, Lord. And then I said, in Jesus Christ's name, Amen. I walked out the door before they could say anything more that's wrong in life. And I began to walk fast and get away from everyone. In the cool breeze in Africa. Isn't that lovely? So I'm walking and walking. I walked about a mile. Nearly a mile. Away from the home enjoying it, just stretching and briskly walking. And suddenly, a car, a vehicle pulls up next to me. The man rolls down the window, and I thought he was going to say, can you direct me to some street? So I said, can I help you? Are you Keith Daniel? I said, yes. Who are you? I don't know you. I've never met you. I've never heard of you before in my life until today. You don't know me. God, and tears started coming down his face. God told me I would find a Keith Daniel in this street. And that I was to give you this. And so I know it was God. That's why I rushed you. I took this little envelope, heavy. And I stood back and just drove off. Don't know his name, never seen him since. 
I was silly. I didn't even take the registration number. He's gone, so I... Thousands of our currency rands were in there. Thousands. Now, this is staggering. No one but Jenny and those people in that little house, the two missionaries and my children, heard the amount that we need. No one knew. Not one cent more. Not one cent less the exact amount. By someone who didn't know me. Do you honestly think God's going to fail you, sir? If you're his responsibility and you fulfill the laws, the, the commandments of God, you, you live what God says and by faith take no thought. You. Wife has a strange habit of doing these things. Years later, we moved to Cape Town and I come home and I said, whatever you boys want, Daddy's always told you, you're my first missing. I've been away all these weeks, but now I make up for lost time. I'm not going to lose you. There's your homeschooling, whatever you're going to do. When you're ready, whatever hours you've got, I give you now. Nonetheless, I say, they say, we want to go to this mall. Can you believe it? Some massive, big complex that's horrible. I'm talking about thousands and thousands of people. It's just open. And there's a big river running around this moor. Can you believe it? The children allowed to use rubber boats or something silly. Well, Daddy, you can hold Mommy's hand in the restaurant and make up for lost time with Mommy <laughs> while we get on the boats. And you can see us, you can watch us because the restaurant's above the thing looking down. I didn't know them. Not a mall. I hate malls, you know. They are obnoxious, horrible obscene places that you have to really be a desperate to stay alive to go to. The atmosphere. Oh, I'd rather go up the mountain. Look at the mountains God's given us. Let's go to the rivers. No, Dad, you said whatever we want. <laughs> so we drive now. And I'm a little bit upset. Fancy coming home and I've got to go to a mall. It's opening its doors and all that. It's a big, big thing, you know, advertise all going on. So we're driving now along the freeway from the one side of a very massive city. And my wife breaks the news, as she so ably can. Keith, uh, we have no meat left in the house. And uh, it's really become an issue because we're getting visitors. And do you think there's any money for us to buy any meat? So I looked at her in horror and I thought, my children have heard that we have no meat. What? I said, God, my children shouldn't have heard that only Jenny had had the wisdom not say that in front of the children. But they remember being a missionary's kid. He didn't even have a meeting home. I was horrified that she said that in front of the kids. So I just prayed. I said, God can't fail us, Jenny. He won't. He never has. He cannot. But I was a little bit grieved. We get to this horrible mall to find that there is literally, I would say, 100,000 vehicles. Oof, as far as the eyes can see. And I couldn't find a parking and I was so happy. I said, listen, it's obviously not the Lord's will. There's not one single parking. But the boys have a remarkable way of saying strange things. We'll pray. I'm talking about little boys. And God will answer our prayers. Oh, you pray, I said. <laughs> Father, give us all oh, within moments after asking. Suddenly, the car pulls out. There it is. <laughs> And Jenny just smiled, knowing I didn't want to go. <laughs> so reluctantly, I parked in this parking. And now we're all about to get out. And suddenly, the car next to us is a man and woman sitting, with children in the back. The man gets out, comes to the window, and knocks on my window. And before I could open the door, he says, Are you Keith Daniel? I said, Yes, I heard you preaching. A few weeks ago, in the Kruta Kirk, Andrew Murray's church in Cape Town, very the most famous pulpit in the whole of Africa, one of the most, and they let me have that pre I was there in your meeting. And he said, I was sitting here in the car, we came to this mall, I don't like malls, he said. Because my wife says there's a special on for meat and some butchery here that drawing the crowds, that you're paying unbelievable price for meat, bulk meat. So we came, we flew the car and he says, I'm about to drive off and suddenly I said to my wife, 
God is speaking to me. Now, I'm scared of that. Trust me, a lot of people said that and God wasn't speaking to them. But he, I said, God, she said, are you mad? God doesn't speak to people. Well, what do you talk? You hear a voice? No. Oh. But I know it's God. Now, this man had tears welling up in his eyes as he was speaking to me. See, what is God saying to you? That I must get meat also for Keith Daniel. She says, but Keith Daniel, where? You don't know where he lives. What are you talking about? How are you going to find Keith Daniel? We've got a long way to go. We can't linger and try and find him now. And as I said, I don't understand it, but that's what the Lord said. I said, no, it's God. As I said that to my wife, you pulled up next to me. This must be God. Do you need meat? Well, I said, children, listen to this. God heard mommy. And God saw daddy praying, groaning about that you had it. And God made sure you know he cannot fail. Hallelujah. By the way, we had so much meat, Jenny had to ask the neighbors and other missionaries down in the Bible school for their fridges. We were for months supplied with meat. Expensive meat. Mutton. That's very expensive in our country. Well, I hope some of you don't believe meeting meat is wrong because then I've said the wrong things here tonight. But nonetheless, isn't that wonderful? Now, we one day, Jenny says her normal thing. It doesn't happen every day, by the way. This is over the years. So don't think we live in this state of her starving until I get home. It doesn't work that way. It just does. Every now and again, suddenly, now mommy says, these needs, you know. So no, my eldest boy, he, he's in London now, godly, godly boy. Oh, what God made him. I'm just scared to think what God made him. He's so beautiful and Christ-like. But when he was little, he hears his mother say this amount, what we need. So I said, oh, he said, Daddy, let me pray. Now, I'm talking about a little boy. I said, okay. But all of us must say amen in the name of Jesus Christ. Because if two or three of you agree touching anything in my name that is the will of the Father, it shall be done. So we all agree. We all say amen to fulfill that promise. So he prays, God, thou canst send someone to our front door. So I opened my eyes. While well, his eyes were shut and everybody shout, Oh no, I thought. He makes things a bit strange here. Daddy doesn't have to go to the bank and find somebody, or the post office, or different things. How can send someone to the door with this amount? Please do just that, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. So everybody else said, Amen. And I said, Oh, to the door now. That limits God, doesn't it? Nonetheless, the next day he got ill. Too ill to go off to the schooling that they were in because we didn't have homeschoolings those days in our country. It wasn't legal. It is now. But, here he is, having to be left at home. And we had to go out and leave this child alone. And God made that happen. We come home. Noel comes out, excitedly, sick and all. Daddy, do you know what happened when you went out? A man came to the door and said, is this where Keith Daniel lives? And he said, Tell your father that I couldn't sleep since last night. I was so burdened that I had to get up early and I still have to go to work. And I only now find this place. Struggling to find the address and the directions to find where Keith Daniel Tell him he must need this money that God made me so burdened I couldn't even sleep. You give this to your father now. He said, Daddy, I opened it up. <laughs> it's exactly what we are. Exact. Now you want to know why is this old missionary saying this? I don't want your money. I only look to Jesus Christ and I've never been guilty of looking at a man. Well, congregation, I only look to Christ and God knows I'm only sharing this now. These things to show you, sir. I don't care if you lose your job. I don't care if this country has a recession. I don't care if there's a bankruptcy across the land and a lack of work. Don't you get anxious if you're God's property. Not this God. And hard times are lying ahead in this world. 
So that's why God's putting these things in my heart to preach these days. Take no thought, friend. No anxious. Don't get anxious being God's child. Don't allow anxiety to settle, and that's the literal Greek, concerning his supply of your essential needs. He doesn't give you your wants. He gives you your needs. I have cars. I've had 14 cars. Most of them I drove until some of them blew up. But that's missionaries. You don't give a car away until it virtually blows up. But then God gives another one. He doesn't fail you. But uh, I, we've had some cars. This one man says to me outside of a convention one day, Shame on you, brother! That's how he said it. Shame on you! Now he said it loud enough to know that this is a public exhibition going on. now. Everybody was to listen. He's speaking to the preacher. Having a vehicle like this, when you're a child of the king, and then he mentioned some American famous preacher who prayed for a Rolls Royce. So his wife said on the television anyway, he got the Rolls Royce. He says, why don't you have faith like that? Instead of driving around as a servant of God, a preacher, in this, this mess. So I stood back and I looked at my car. I said, I think it's rather a nice car. It's old, but it's, it's wonderful. It doesn't give me troubles. And I said, listen, if I had a Rolls Royce and I went to a town to preach, no one would give me a cent. I'd soon be driving in the towns in a Rolls Royce like a skeleton. No one, no one on earth would have this poor man. I've got more than they. God would be, that wouldn't be God's will. This is what God wants me to have. That would be stupid. If I had a Rolls Royce company, I'd sell it and I'd supply one year's salaries to missionaries across southern Africa. Oh, I couldn't sleep with such a thing in my position. Would I want such a thing for me? Oh, he was very grieved. By the way, I said something that shook everyone outside of that hall because everyone suddenly was aware this man was confrontational. He was a bit of a sensationalist. So, I said, Sir, I feel shamed about the man you're preaching. You're speaking about this preacher in America. And if this is what he believes is God's will, it shows how far he is from God. And I guarantee you he will bring great shame on God's name in the church worldwide soon. Two weeks later, every newspaper on earth on the front pages, had his photograph and his story of the sin and evil he was living. No one will forget that I said that. Two weeks before the whole world knew how shameful his life was. Be careful now. God doesn't give you your wants. He gives you your needs, and He knows how much you need. And brother, I want to tell you something. You need very little of what most people think they have to have to survive to be happy. Millionaires, I know them. They commit suicide. They attempt suicide. So many, it's beyond comprehension how many I've had to pray with. You try to take. You think wealth will make you feel happy and face life? You want to know misery? Try and be a millionaire. Most anyway. Be careful. Don't take that too far. But there's truth in that. Oh, God does do wonderful things. I remember my sons in London. They were very small. We were, I was preaching in Edinburgh. Afterwards, they set us up in London in a missionary home. And we were walking all over London. I've been many, many times to London as I crisscross cross to America. always go via London. And now the children are small. We're walking and walking and walking. And we find Buckingham Palace especially, where the Queen lives, and Prince Philip. We went the wrong way. We went all past Hyde Park along Green Park. We went the whole way around. Suddenly I said, where is Buckingham Palace? We have walked. We're acting. This gentleman says, this is Buckingham Palace, but you're at the back of it. This is the Queen's Garden here, where she has all these garden parties with thousands of people. You have to carry on walking here about, I'd say, half a mile. 
and you'll reach the front where the famous view of the Buckingham Palace is. So I said, oh, at least we found the place. So now we're walking. And the children say, do you think we'll see the Queen, Daddy? I said, no. Why not? If we're only in London now, we might never come back. I said, because it's not her birthday, it's not the changing of the gods, and she doesn't just come out because South Africans are there. In the front and wave, you know. It just doesn't happen, so forget it. But at least we'll see the place she lives. So, the children, we should pray. And I looked. Oh, no, we're going to pray, my one son. Oh, he's adamant. Standing, we're going to pray. We're going to ask God to let us see the queen. If we're not here long, we might never come back, daddy. So, of course, Jenny looks quite sick at him. Sickly at him in shock. We're going to pray and ask God. Now I said, you pray. I can't pray and say, God, let us see the queen. Lord, how to say, and he quotes scriptures. And if two or three agree, and he said, say amen, <laughs> he copies me, you know. So, please let us see the queen. Even if it's not her birthday, even if she doesn't come out, let us see the queen. So I looked at them as they prayed. And he reminded me, say amen loud, daddy. So I did. So we're walking. A few minutes of walking, suddenly a siren, about 50 police on motorbikes, other vehicles all suddenly coming out of the wall. Well, those big gates, sorry. Of the wall, of like, right at the back, not the front. They didn't want to go out the front because of the crowds and crowds that are there. You see. So she has a side gate. And coming past... The only people was us. And as the cars go by, my son says, It's the Queen. I know it's the Queen. So I looked in horror and I looked. And there was the Queen and Prince Philip. And what do they do? They look, wave to my children. Philip especially kept looking back. <laughs> do you think that has happened? That God is so perfect in integrity and kindness beyond comprehension to a child who believes, who isn't presumptuous, who isn't carnal, who isn't just something to show that little boy that he's there. He's really there. Hallelujah. And those boys now, you want to see what they pray for. Oh, I could go on and on and on and on and on and on. We have prayed. So many things for God to do. Standing, crying to God to close down evil, filthy, depraved houses of iniquity. And how God just closed them down. One after, as we pray. Because we pray. And I preached that on a video that was sent across the whole world. Virtually, the English speaking world and other countries. Even Russia, people writing to me. Phoning. They've heard and you cannot believe the phone calls, the letters, the emails from that one sermon alone of people, even across America, who just come up to young people. Sir, we saw that video. We started praying for God to close down all the evil places of this town. And every place we prayed, we stood crying unto God, God has closed every one. Do you know what God waits for us to do to the things we're grieving at? Can you imagine the history of this nation turning? If every Christian began to cry to a God in faith, you have not, because you ask not. What a staggering rebuke for God to give us as we lose our nation to the devil. Why? If only Christians got right with God. And they can. And got on their knees. As an army and stormed heaven, this whole nation would stagger the world. The way it changed and turned from evil that you say can't turn, you believe won't turn, it's gone too far. No, sir! I don't care how close to the end times we're living and I don't care what it says about the end times. There's no nation if the people of God and there's enough in this nation. Get right with God that God isn't obligated to stagger the world through them even in the last days. God doesn't become unfaithful to his promises. No one's looking at the watch. Who looked at the watch? Put your hand up. 
you were very lucky that you didn't say you. <laughs> so, do you give me five minutes or must I end now? Tell me, brother. Oh, you're very kind, but there's some people here that say, Whoa. <laughs> All right, last illustration, because I just think it's needed. One man, a very godly preacher in our country, phones me and says, Brother Keith, we have grievous problem with our son. He wants the devil. He wants to serve Satan, not God. And he's become angry with us that he doesn't want to see us, speak to us. He hates us. And he began to weep on the phone. He hates his God. He hates his mother. Oh, brother, you don't know the same we're going through. I'm aging at this boy. When he reached this age, he said, Daddy, you forced me to these meetings, to these conventions from a child to this day. It's finished. I'll never go near these meetings again. I don't want Christianity. I want the war. And I'm going now, and I'm getting out of it. He says, Brother, my wife and I are now weeping. We're talking about you. And we remembered that, to our knowledge, the only time that boy sat up straight and didn't move through a sermon was when you were preaching one day. And it shook us that this boy's listening. He didn't ever say anything, but he listened. Normally he's angry and moving and disturbing everybody. He so doesn't want God. He doesn't even want anybody else. He wants God. He says, Brother, won't you go and speak to my son? He won't see us. We're not allowed near him. And he's an angry man and he's a big man. He's a man. He gave me how to get hold of this young fellow at his workplace. And I arrived there, asked for this boy, and they led me into this office. And when he saw me, I walked slowly towards him and he saw me coming and he got up and he shook the whole room, that whole office. In anger, he just began to flare up. Did my father send you? Yes. Get out! And he came to me. Get out! Pushing. Get out! I don't want God! You tell my father never to send anybody near me again, or I'll hurt them. Get out! People, as I looked past some ladies, began to weep in shock. They didn't know of him to be like this. An angry young man. It's a horrible thing to see. as he pushed me. And I was hurt the way he pushed me. And he saw it and he felt bad. And I said, listen, you, you may be able to stop me speaking to you about God. You may be able to stop me from speaking to you about God, but you cannot stop me from speaking to God about you. And I want you to listen carefully, young man. Every day of my life, I'm going to be groaning to God to make your life misery in your sin. But you will not have one occasion in sin that won't end up in devastation. You won't be able to make friends with sinners that won't end up in devastation. And until I hear you found God as your Savior, I will pray that prayer. And God will. You should have seen his eyes looking at me. And I walked away. Now, I think it was two years later. I'm not 100% sure. It was a while back. But I think it was two. Sometimes God doesn't bow. He doesn't press buttons when you pray for souls. He's got to do with a free will. But that doesn't mean don't pray. That doesn't mean God isn't turning the world upside down to his work. You keep praying, even if you see a smile on his face, he's weeping. Trust me. If you're praying and you're right with God, that doesn't mean perfect, but your heart is a pursuit of God. And you are living in the light you've been given, as best as you can, looking to the blood for any isolated failure. Now, I pray. Two years later, I was in this conference, and I was down in the washroom, just washing my face, and somebody touched my back. 
in his washroom. So I turned around, all wet, because I was, anyway, there. He says, do you remember me? So I looked at him. Oh, yes, I remember you. He says, sir, when you said those words, I trembled. And sir, every single day from that day my life lay in ruins. Every friendship, every occasion that I wanted to get out there and enjoy sin and sinners, I had to some places run for my life. Everything just crumbled. Every friendship, every occasion, nothing. I can't think of one. I just sat in my room at night and said, that Keith Daniel, praying! going wrong. He says, well, sir, I came all this way across this country when I heard that you were going to be preaching at this convention. And I came all this way because I wanted to say this to your face. You can stop praying. I'm saved. I'm saved. He became a missionary to this day. Ask, and it shall be given you. The Greek, keep on asking. Don't give up if it isn't just straight away. Sometimes you've got to just, but don't believe God isn't answering. Don't believe God isn't making that boy tremble. Weep! When no one else is looking. And you wonder why I'm in so many years. You just pray. Elijah didn't give up when the rain didn't come straight away, you know. He went down. He says to his servant, Can you see any clouds? Do you see anything? Nothing. He's praying, this great man of God. Does he stop? Oh, God doesn't answer my prayers anymore. No, just get straight down again. Prayed again. Is there anything? Nothing. Twice. Earnestly, no. Down. Look again. No. Down. He just carried on until God came. Because he knew God would come. And when it's time we have to do that, isn't that a God? Well, he saw a little cloud and said, run. <laughs> it's coming. Wow. The whole sky covered with darkness and clouds as he began to run. His faith, he just had to see a little cloud for me. He knew this God, this God cannot fail. It's not the will of God. Just don't stop praying. But the fact that he kept on and on and on like that, isn't historical record of what happened. It was written for you and me to just keep on until your son sobs because nothing of sin gives him joy because you are praying. Now, some of you might have thought another message would be appropriate, but trust me, this is what God wanted everyone, even the young people here tonight. Leave the rest to God, sir. That's all. Can we stand, please? In the front, there are some of these newsletters my dear wife sends out and Don Corvell to many thousands of homes. Every issue. If you'd like to have to pray for me in a ten, nine-week tour of America... Every day preaching apart from some Thursdays as I fly to the next day. Please take to be able to pray. If you'd like to receive it consistently every second, third month with about two months of my preaching program anywhere in the world, you're only a prayer away. Suddenly you're affecting. And if you are going to pray, not just for a year, but until Christ comes or takes you, please put your name and address down. You would honor us to be among the thousands of homes worldwide. 
that pray every day for this old man. Will you please put your name and address down if you really are going to pray for God to come keep me faithful and true till I die, no matter what happens to me. To let there be great fruit on every meeting. God's fruit, not what we're looking for, what God wants to work. To keep my family safe, spiritually, right with God, a blaze for God through their lives. You'll be able to pray soberly through the new day. Take a copy if you'd like to. One per family, please, if you'd like to. Now, dear brother, you're going to come and commit us to Christ again. A short prayer. Fancy a man preaching this long, telling you to be short. I do it because some preachers will be guilty of one thing. My wife says the trouble with preachers is they can never stop preaching. And she always is right, Jim. Never been wrong. Tragic. So, brother, that's because I know you're a preacher and you're wonderful. And I bless God for the spirit with which you just reveal Christ and earnestness of souls and the privilege of being in your pulpit. And I have no doubt if you stay low and do what you're doing in the light you've been doing, God's going to do great things for you, brother. I've sensed that of you. I don't say that to many people, brother, so don't think it's superficial. You're going to commit us to Christ. The pastor and I will be at the door to shake your hands and all you're going to say is goodbye. Otherwise, we'll be here another hour. And those that linger, I won't say goodbye because I'm going to go soon. Thank you. Now, what are you going to do with this message? I dare you to answer God no matter who you are. Answer him now before you walk out that door. What are you going to do with this message? Beginning tonight. Every day, till you die. Lord, we just we just honor you tonight. The guilt of the church. The guilt of the church is just being hearers of the word and not doers. Lord, tonight we thank You for the faith that was built upon the message of this man of God that You've used through all of these years. Brother Keith, to many of us in America, whether he knows it or not, is he's our Will McFarland. And we thank God for him. But I don't want to get rebuked by him. I'm not bragging on Brother Keith, but the Lord in him. And Lord, that those that we're hearing tonight, sometimes, Lord, even through messages, you speak and save people through your presence even. Lord, if there's one that's lost tonight, that they wouldn't resist the blood, the drawing. Lord, that they would take what has been through these meetings. Lord, from the other churches that are here, Lord, just...